This video is going to be a little follow-up to a video I just did with the International Association of Woodcarvers. I'll include a link below in the description to that video. In that video I kind of go through a history of the style of carving that I do mainly called flat plane carving and I also kind of talk about how I got started with carving and my journey overall. And then at the end I did a little demo of carving this gnome right here but I ran out of time to paint it so I figured I'd do that right now. So for painting I usually just use a few simple tools. For this guy I'll use just two paint brushes. Um, you can totally use one but um, since I have some paintbrushes that have just been sitting around for a while, I've been, you know, I've been getting a lot of use out of them. They get a bit of a different texture that I kind of prefer for doing some things over a newer brush that has a sharper edge to it. So I'll use two paintbrushes and a toothpick. The toothpick is my favorite painting tool. I really like it for doing little details like eyes and then some little decorative dots like what we'll get to. Um, so... Uh, the first actual step that I do for getting ready for painting is I mix a base coat. And usually, when I'm just painting myself, I use a big jug of the base coat like this. But for demonstration purposes, I will mix up one new. So you start out with just some water, and you don't need a ton of it. I'll maybe make a little extra just because I can dump it in that bigger container afterwards. And so I like to paint a, ba a dark base coat over the whole thing. So I'll start with black. This is just black acrylic paint. Um, the brand I'm using is Apple Barrel for most of these paints, but you can use whatever, whatever you have or whatever you have access to. This is real inexpensive paint, so um, you can just add a few drops. And, and then I also usually like to add a bit of brown to the base coat just to warm up the base coat a bit. So I'll use this Nutmeg Brown and I'll add just a couple drops of that. And then I just use the back of a paintbrush, the back of the handle, to mix it up. And it looks like this might be good enough. It's kind of nice to have different base coats for each carving. So sometimes it can be nice to mix things up separately like this, just to keep some variety. So to test out how thick this is, I can't really tell by looking at it. It looks like it might be a bit thin, but when you apply it to either newspaper or like this brown paper bag that I'm using here, you can kind of get a sense of how much it's going to uh, cover up the wood grain. So this looks, this looks pretty good. It looks pretty thin, maybe on the thinner side, but uh, we can always adjust it later if we have to. So next up, I actually like to wet the face just with plain water before painting the base coat over the carving. And that's so that the base coat doesn't, you know, darken up certain areas. Like if we were going to leave certain areas white, we can also do this with the hair. We can leave, um, we, can, we can paint water over the hair and any other lighter areas where we don't want the base coat to soak in too much. But... The idea for this gnome is to do things a little differently. I think we'll paint his hair black. We'll paint maybe the hat orange and the robe green so we can have like a Halloween gnome since it's around Halloween time here. Um, just something different. Usually I use like a red hat and a light blue robe. Um, but yeah, just to be timely, we can, we can do things a little differently. You can use, of course, whatever colors you prefer. So... I will wet the face though. I'll wet the face and you don't have to be uh, real precise with your painting or with your application of this water. You can just kind of slop it on there. It can even go on the hat a little bit, you know, because the paint that we actually apply, the actual colors will kind of soak into the wood as they, as they will and they'll cover this up. This is just a little bit of a precaution so that the base coat the base coat won't sink in quite as much. So, uh, yeah, maybe a little bit of water on the on the little mittens here. So you can see on his, on his mittens that you can't really see any details of any fingers or even the thumbs. And the idea there was that these are really woolly mittens. They're really furry. So it's a, it's a good way, uh, especially if you don't want to carve a lot of detail or if you're a beginner at carving, it's a good way to kind of get around some of that detail. 
So, all right, so that is applying the water. Now we can actually apply the base coat. This looks, this looks pretty good. Um, this is about the same thickness that I normally dilute my base coats to. Um, sometimes you can go a little lighter. This might be a little on the thicker side, but for this Halloween gnome, I think it'll work just fine. So we're just covering the whole carving. No need to be careful at all. No need to be precise. Covering the whole thing. I'm not being super careful about the direction I'm going in either. You don't really have to paint with the grain. You might notice that I am painting with the grain. Uh, I think that's just to make it make the paint soak up a little more evenly. If I was going like this, then I would be very tempted to just paint up anyways. I think that's more about the shape of the piece rather than really caring about the grain of the wood here. Um, I like to keep the, the bottom a little even. It's okay to cover up all the wood down here. It can be kind of fun just to show some of the bare wood through, just so you can remember and just so you can show people this is the color of uh, what the wood started out as. So that's about it for applying the base coat. You can see the wood grain is still really beautifully showing through. It's actually accentuated. That's part of the reason I apply the base coat. Another reason I apply the base coat is so that we can use other painting techniques um, such as kind of blending colors together and we can have some really nice dry brushing. A lot of carvers like to paint individual colors. They like to mix up colors just like we did for the base coat and apply those separately as a wash to different areas. Like this hat would be uh, orange in our case, so they would paint on the orange and then they would paint the hair white and it would all be about that same thickness, maybe a little thicker. But then if you get two colors touching each other, like the, you know, the hair and the hat, two different colors, and you touch them together while the paint is still wet, then you can get one color to bleed up into the other color. And that is not usually what we want. So with this method, we're going to be actually applying full strength paints to the wood directly while the base coat is still wet. So it'll be full strength paint, but you know, practically, once we get the once we get the paint actually applied, it'll be blended in as if it wasn't really full strength. So here's what we do: we don't want to cover up the grain too much. So we also don't need this black for the hair to be extremely thick, anyways. So we're just kind of going to dry off the brush a little bit, and then with the remaining paint, we're just going to go in and kind of brush it back and forth. You want to be a little careful to not just go crazy and cover everything, but the nice thing about at least acrylic paints is um, lighter colors can cover up darker colors easily than vice versa. So basically if we paint over the, the skin tone, uh, we're, this is going to be kind of a Caucasian gnome, uh, if we paint over his lighter skin tone, we will uh, be able to uh, correct that when we actually apply the skin tone very easily because the skin tone will be able to cover up the, the darker beard color. So, I like to make the paint in each area a little uneven. Uh, and that's not to say splotchy or anything like that, but You'll notice that as we go towards the face, the paint gets a little thinner and the black gets a little less black. That adds some nice variation. So that's the black and you'll notice that we, in some parts of right under the hat, we kind of got some black paint on there. So we can add a little more just to make it even. You can always wipe off a little bit and the same goes for underneath there as well. We're starting with the darkest color. We're starting with black so that all the other colors that we paint can cover up the previous colors. So that is the beard. That's all we really need to do. Uh, and of course, even though we're kind of going darkest first, we can always go back and add in uh, more dark colors later on if we want to. I'll just cleaning off my brush right now, real easy. I just kind of whip it around in some clean water, 
and then I wipe the brush a little bit onto the placemat here. So, let's see. Next up, we're going to go with a orange and green color scheme. I was thinking about having the orange be for the hat and the green for the robe, but now I'm thinking the other way around might be kind of interesting. Yeah, let, let's do the green for the hat. Let's see how that turns out. If you ever really don't like the way that some colors turn out, you can always carve them off afterwards. So we're going with this green. Specifically, this is English Ivy Green. You can feel free to use whatever colors you have around. Um, and we're just going to do the same thing. One thing that I notice is that all these different paints that I have are from different years. I've acquired them in different ways. Some of them I've bought recently. Some of them were uh, handed down to me. So they're all kind of different consistencies and maybe even kind of different qualities. I kind of like that. It's kind of fun to have with the variation. It keeps each color interesting. Like you can see this is this is real thin down already just straight out of the tube. It's a lot more thin than the black was. So I'm kind of reapplying green as we go here just to just to make it cover the wood a little more. But still we don't want to cover up the green. You can still see the green. Let's see if I can get the camera in focus. You can still see the green. You don't want to cover up the green because then your figure might look a little bit like plastic. And that's usually not the goal. So there I was kind of painting across the grain and then when I when I sh when I was able to shine the hat in the light a little bit I could see kind of a, a horizontal separation between where I was going where I was painting cross grain and when I was painting with the grain so I'm just going to kind of even that out kind of spread the paint a little more evenly uh, and you'll see that the back of this hat, if you have the if you have the hat angled like this, where it's sloping this way into the grain here and kind of uh, away from the grain, out of the grain towards the back, you'll notice that the paint is accepted into the wood differently in the front versus the back. That's because we're seeing a lot more end grain this way, um, and uh, over here on the back, it's a little. It's not only sloped inwards like this. It's also a lot less sloped compared to this. So this is getting a lot more of the face grain, or this is, you're seeing a lot more of the end grain here. Whoops, I kind of got in the way of the camera. So that's green. Now we can go and paint the robe. I'm still kind of eyeballing up this little area, his little wool gloves or mittens, and I think we're gonna go with kind of a grayish color. So it's already gray, but later on we might want to add a little, a little bit more gray pigmentation into there. So this is going to be a pumpkin orange, and this is another paint that I already have watered down inside the tube just a little bit, so it's not going to be completely full strength. And you'll notice it's very bright um, as, it, as it blends into this base coat. You know, it's another advantage of the base coat. The base coat helps keep things a little muted, and for my style of painting, I like to have the, the colors a bit muted. You can, see the, you can see the difference here. Huge difference. So, just gonna keep on blending this orange into the wood. I've never painted a gnome like this. Never painted a Halloween gnome. I've never done any Halloween carvings except one pumpkin, like a jack-o'-lantern pin that you could wear. I've never worn it though. Never had the opportunity. I'm being a little more careful here. I don't really want to get this orange into the hair too much. Although if we did, we could we could do a slight amount of blending the orange into the hair. Hair can have, you know, a little bit of different colorations within it. It can be black hair, but there can be, you know, elements of orange pigment anyways. All right. Sometimes I wet my brush just to be able to blend the paint into the grain a bit more. 
doesn't need to be real precise. You don't need a you don't need to wet your brush every certain number of minutes or anything like that. You can just do it. You can just feel it. You can just feel it out. See when it feels right. You don't oops. You don't have to get real perfect with with this piece either. Um, you don't have to get this orange right up next to the the next color over, which in this case is black. It looks kind of antiqued if you leave a little bit of space in between those two colors. Uh, and the more you commit to that, the better. Like here, I'm not committing to that too much. I'm kind of trying to get the orange on the insides of the sleeves just a little bit. But if I were to leave the gray, the base coat showing through on that part of the sleeve and on this part of the sleeve, it, it would have that antique look. It wouldn't be necessary to paint all the way in there. All right, so this side looks like it could use a little more orange. This side looks nice and orange already. So let's get some more orange in here. You'll notice that I always paint this, I take this full strength paint out of the actual caps of the paint. Um, you could say, oh, you know, you might be getting a little might be muddying the paint a little bit, you might be getting a little water in there, but of course I don't really mind. It won't affect the paint that much anyways, so if the paint changes a little over time, it's all part of the fun. All right. You can, you can be done with this part whenever you want. I'm just kind of going for a certain look, a certain level of having this paint be absorbed into the grain. If you don't care about all that, that's totally fine, of course. All right, that's looking interesting. Uh, let's see, next color, we can, we can give a little bit of gray to the, to the mittens. Let's do, uh, let's see, maybe a kind of a brownish gray. This is a color called Country Tan. One of my, one of my most common colors, I would say. I would say black, white, Country Tan, Burnt Umber, and Burnt Sienna, which are kind of a brownish, well, a brown and a kind of brownish reddish color. Both very nice and very nice earthy colors for all sorts of carvings like this. Uh, my, my brush is very wet right now, so it's, right now it's just really, really putting on a thin layer of, of this gray, which is fine. I think I would like to do a little bit more of like a dry brushed gray. I might add some white to this gray later on just to really make it look like a wool or some kind of fur texture. Yeah, this, this gray isn't that different from the base coat so it's not going to make that much of a difference. And let's do the face now. Oops. I don't really need to clean off my brush too good because the, the tan isn't too different from this flesh color. All right, just now we can just dust this flesh tone onto here. Also being a little careful to not get too much of the flesh color onto the green of the hat. We're just gradually making the face more and more uh, to the tone that we're aiming for, whatever tone that is. Of course, skin tone comes in a wide range of colors and tones. As the paint dries, it changes color just a little bit. So as you, as you rotate back to the other side, you might see that it got a little more gray. It might have soaked into the base coat a little more. So feel free to just keep applying more of the paint. Kind of bringing the face color down into the cheeks a little more. 
if you have the hair going real up close in the cheeks, real close to the eyes, it could kind of look like a bit of a wolf man. Which, I guess that would make sense for a Halloween gnome. Wolf gnome. You can use your fingers like I'm doing now to blend the paint into the wood even more. Sometimes it blends it in and kind of wipes it off a little more than you expect even. Uh, okay. And that works. And now with just a tiny, tiny light dusting of flesh tone on my brush, I'm gonna dry brush around the hair just a little bit. So we don't we don't need it we don't want this hair to look jet black necessarily. I mean you can, you can you can do that, but I'm not going for jet black. I'm going for a little bit of, a little bit of a gray, aging him just a little bit, and this is also to be honest a good way to account for some of this flesh tone going into the hair. Make it intentional. <laughs> so if it's unintentional, it'll look like a mistake, but if you work it into the design, it becomes a design feature. So that works. That's, that's okay. Um, and now again, without cleaning off our brush, I'm going to dip it in this this red. This is red spice. I remember that even though it doesn't have the label. It's another very good color. I use it a lot for blushing the, the faces and different parts of the skin of, of carvings. We're getting this brush real dry and now we're gonna first apply it to the nose to rosy up the nose, make it look like he has some blood flow in him. Don't want him to look real pale unless you want him to look scared, as a scared Halloween gnome. Get a little on the cheeks as well. You'll notice that when we're dry brushing like this, the paint likes to go mainly on like the, the separations between different facets that we have carved into here. But if you keep on brushing, it'll, it'll get a little more, it'll even out a bit more. get my brush just a little wet now. Actually that's about as wet as it gets. And then I'll dry it off a little bit and then I'll be able to blend this in. I want this blushing to be a little more even and a little bit more of like a gradient. We want it to just blend into the rest of the skin tone that we have. We're not going for like the little circle of rosy cheeks. Not quite what we're going for with this guy. Okay, now you can see that the blushing is really kind of a, a gradient, and I have kind of harsh light on this right now. But you might be able to see just a little bit that, that there's a bit of a gradient. All right, we're getting very close to being done. I would say next, he's looking a little weird without eyebrows. So next we can paint on his eyebrows a little bit. For this we'll use the other brush since it's more sharp, more fresh. We'll, tip, uh, we'll dip the tip of the paintbrush into there. Brush it off a little bit on, on the placemat. And now you can, you can either go crazy and have really big eyebrows, really big bushy eyebrows, or you can go a little more thin. I'm going, I'm going kinda, kinda bushy with this guy. We had a nice brow ridge on him when we carved him, so there's plenty of space up here. Of course, if you want him to look scared, you can have his, or surprised, you can have his eyebrows up higher. If you want him to look angry, of course, you can angle them in. I'm going a little bit neutral. I'm going like neutral, but like heavy, because these eyebrows are so big. So we'll see what his expression looks like. I'm putting a little arch on him so he might look a little inquisitive. Yeah, it looks he's got some big old messy eyebrows. That works. Now, next we can lay in the whites of the eyes just to get them going as we look around a little bit on at the at the rest of the wood because we want the whites of the eyes to kind of dry before adding in any more colors to them. So 
you know, dip your little toothpick here in, in a little dot of white paint and then just real finely, just real gently drop in some white. That got a little big. If you want to narrow those eyes up later, we can very easily do that. I'll actually, I'll show you how to do that. Those eyes are a little, just a little bigger than what I normally do. Um, so now, so I can feel the wood, it's still, it's still kind of wet. So if we want to do some general dry brushing around here, it's not the ideal time. You want to wait a little bit until there, until it's a little more dry before you do that. So, but that said, uh, let's see, where would I do dry brushing? I think we, we won't, yeah, we won't dry brush the hat. We might do some dry brushing down here and on his robe a little bit. Um, so for now, what I'll do is I'll start making just a real simple design and designs like what I'm about to do, just taking some black, designs like this work on a variety of carvings. Just about any carving, even if it's an animal, you can paint designs like this. So I'm gonna take little dots of black and I'm gonna do a, a bit of a pattern. I'm gonna do like a, a three dot motif you see that? Just three little dots in like a triangle. And I'm going to kind of space that motif evenly around the hat. Or close to even. Doesn't have to be perfect. This is kind of a classic folk art motif. It's kind of a floral pattern if you think about it. It could represent, it could represent a flower or some kind of leaves, or even, like, it could just represent a kind of a triangular shape. Uh, you can really let anyone who's looking at this, anyone who's looking at this can kind of decide for themselves what they think it is, what it means to them. So, looking good, getting a little more dry as we speak. I think by now the, the mitten area should be good for some dry brushing. So we'll go back to the white again, and we'll take the more bristly brush, the used older brush, and we'll make sure to really dry that off. Um, you can press out the water with your finger, really squish it out of there, just to get it dry nice and quickly. And once it's dry, you can dip it in the white, dust it off on the placemat, and I dust it to the point where you don't want any like streaks of white to come back off on, on the placemat when you're going like that. So you can see that it's pretty dry. There's not much white, but there's just enough to do some nice dry brushing. With dry brushing, again, it can be a gradual process of laying on more and more. Um, and with this guy, let's, let's kind of dry brush this white all around his robe. And I can see here that I accidentally touched the black dots on the hat before they dried. Let's see. Wow, I didn't mess up the design. Cool. That's fine. You can kind of rub that off and we can even dry brush a little over it. Adds character. I'm really just highlighting the facets that we left with the knife. This is one reason that, you know, you don't have to sand your carvings. You can kind of, uh, you can kind of admire the facets that the knife leaves. All right. We can work that into a design. There's a little bit of a black smudge here. You can kind of see that from where my finger touched <laughs> the black dots and then I touched this. We can, we can work that in somehow. So next I'm going to place my paintbrush back in the water, close up this tube, and I think we're going to go straight to the irises. So for the irises, I'm using uh, a lighter green. This happens to be spring green. And I'm going to paint in just a little bit of this green. He's going to be looking off to our right. And we, we still, of course, have the pupils after this, so you don't need to necessarily fill that whole area with green. But I usually kind of do anyways. The pupils will kind of 
cover the whole right side of the irises, probably, depending on how, how big you make them. That's a nice kind of piercing green. All right. He's looking Halloween-y, I can tell you that. Uh, let's see. I think we should continue on with the spirit of that motif that we have at the top at the hat. We should kind of continue that, but uh, onto the robe, but let's make it a little bigger. Instead of three petals to this design, three dots to this design, let's go with, let's see, let's have a center dot. And uh, let's see, let's do five. Five dots, just like that. So that's, I mean, that looks a little more like a floral pattern but still it doesn't have to, you don't have to think of it as floral, it could be more, it could represent a star. You could paint, you know, of course you could paint out a, a full star just to make your motif more verbatim, less up for debate. Just keeping things relatively even here. And that means we're gonna have one more motif there. Now, you know, we turned a mistake, a little black smudge into part of a design, painted right over it. It works. Let's add a little bit of a little single dot between all of these to connect them. And let's add one on this side and one on that side, just for fun. One between here and one between here. And let's see. Let's go, let's do three dots around the bottom. Same as the motif around the hat. This will kind of link the hat design to the robe even more than the other design did. So now it's kind of tied together. We have kind of a coherent design. Looks like the irises are still drying. So we're gonna let that rest for a second. Uh, I think I'd like to add just a tiny bit more color into the robe design. So I'm gonna wipe off the toothpick now. And let's see, we have orange, we have green, we have black, but I'm really liking, you know, constraining it to that few colors. We could always add in, you know, blues and reds and different things like that. Um, I actually, you know, red might be a good idea. I think red would be a good, a good Halloween color as well. And it won't contrast too much from the red of the robe, so it won't stick out a ton. I think that'll be, I think that'll be nice. So let's see, let's do red in between these dots, in between the single dots that we have on this motif. Yeah, I think this, this looks kind of interesting. Nice. And let's do the same around the bottom of the robe. As I'm doing this, I'm considering maybe painting in some really simple buttons on the front of the robe where you see it's separated from itself. I think that could be, I think that could work. Um, for those, let's make, them, let's make them green, the same color as the hat. Green buttons on an orange robe, it's kind of weird. But it's for Halloween. Just a few, let's see. Maybe make them a little bigger, just a little bigger than the other single dots that we have. Yeah, three's a good number. All right. It kind of works. It's a little, you know, it's pretty off-centered. Uh, yeah, now I'm kind of thinking adding another row on the other side to match that. This is how it is. This is how designing patterns like this tends to go for me. 
start out really simple and then keep on seeing opportunities where you could add some more interest. Um, I think we need to, you know, on that note, I think we need to continue the little black dots because now this area in the middle, it's nice to have the green, but now it's looking a little light. A little, yeah, the colors are a bit light. So to darken it up a little bit, add some tiny dots in between those. And even on top here. Okay, that connects it to both. Yeah, that, that's good. That connects it to this row of detail and the bottom row of detail. Nice. And it's still, I, I would say it's still not gaudy. I, I, I would say this is still a very simple design. It's just made of dots. Um, so yeah, I'm okay with that. Uh, the irises are almost dry. Just about dry. So while that's waiting, <laughs> we can add some more dots. We'll wait for that. Okay, so there's dots around the bottom. There's dots around the bottom of the hat. There's dots around here. So it almost makes me think that around the bottom of the sleeves, we should have some dots, just simple ones. We don't want to detract from the rest of the design. And we're looking out here with a nice little bit of spacing. Uh, we can easily fit three dots. That's a very small dot. All right, we're in the garage now and we're gonna do the very final step, which is going to be dipping the gnome into some linseed oil. Linseed oil is one of my favorite wood finishes. You can use other types of finish like Danish oil is another good one. You can also use types of wax. Uh, min wax paste wax has been used by wood carvers. Also things like Howard's feed and wax, which is like a mixture of beeswax and orange oil. So there's plenty of different options, but we're going with linseed oil, which is kind of a tried and true finish. It's This particular type of linseed oil isn't food safe, so I won't use this for spoons but for figures it works just fine. So here's the gnome. Nothing has changed with him. He's ready to go. He's all painted up. And first things first, I'll put on some gloves. Whatever gloves work, some kind of rubber or plastic gloves are probably ideal because uh, you don't want to get this stuff on your hands. So this is where I keep my linseed oil and I keep it in a container like this just because it makes it easier to dip the entire carving in. So I just simply take the carving, I dip it in like this all the way in, I let it drip a little bit, and then I take some tongs. These are some old tongs I've been using for a long time for dipping carvings in linseed oil. Take the tongs and I dunk them in the other way. And I let this drip just a little longer, um, just to I don't know. You're not really saving a lot of linseed oil by having this drip back in the container, but um, I usually, when I use linseed oil with basswood carvings, I usually don't really wipe, wipe them down afterwards. So it's nice to have a little bit of extra linseed oil on the carving, like coating the whole carving as you're doing this, but you don't need, you know, puddles covering the entire carving. So let it drip just a bit. You could, of course, um, be holding this with your gloves as long as, as long as you're wearing gloves. And I'm actually going to probably very gingerly touch it here as I'm placing it onto the mat. Um, 
I use the tongs just so you have a little less points of contact, just so you don't leave like an impression. These gloves are kind of textured. Um, probably won't make much of a difference, but just some different tools to keep uh, the linseed oil off your hands and onto the carving. And so yeah, this, this linseed oil, uh, because it's so nice and thin and because the basswood is so absorbent, it's kind of, it's a pretty softer, it's a pretty soft hardwood. Um, so it'll, it'll really absorb the linseed oil. So we don't really need to wipe this down. Uh, it will take some time to dry. I would say at least a week before I would uh, really want it in the house next to me because uh, it'll still kind of smell. Linseed oil has a pretty strong smell, but yeah, I would give it about a week or so in the garage to be, you know, to be quite dry. And then after that, I'd bring it in, ready to go, ready to sell or to give as a gift or whatever you want to do. So there it is, the Halloween gnome.